Hello, my name is Brent Gervais. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with Constance Kurtz, digital freedom activist and hacker, and also computer scientist and author. She's a spokeswoman of the Chaos Computer Club and also works with Netpolitik, a digital freedom organization doing good work here in Germany. We recently had a really nice conversation and I hope you enjoy it too. Well, Constance, uh, thank you so much for being here at the Nextcloud Community Conference. Hi, nice to be here. Great. Um, can you introduce yourself a little bit for those who might not know who you are? I mean, they're listening from a little bit all over the world. Well, my name is Constanze, Constanze Kultz, and I'm a German uh, computer scientist from education, but um, I'm also a hacker and the spokesperson of the German Chaos Computer Club. And I work for um, Netzpolitik.org. This is a German platform. Um, and we're writing about the, the, the politics, about regulation, about tech, about surveillance. Uh, yeah, all the stuff which I talked about earlier today. Of course. Yeah, you gave a keynote earlier today that was really amazing. And we'll touch on a lot of those those topics, of course. Can you um, give us a bit more of a sense of NetPolitik, the kind of work you do, how many people you're working with, and the influence that you might have? Well, actually, uh, we are 16 people now, and uh, I have the pl privilege that the readers support us. So we are completely independent. We don't have any tracking or advertising or stuff, but we have a lot of supporting readers who give us money th so that we can do the work we do. And in, well, well speaking of content, we have every major debate about tech in the last 20 years. Actually, uh, the day before the, that podcast year, we had our 20th anniversary. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And I feel it's a privilege because we are really independent mm -hmm. and that's how we can write about tech. Wow. Um, as a business model, you know, that's, that's actually a big ask in the world of advertising. And, you know, advertising seems to run the internet and the businesses on the internet so how is that going trying to do something that's you know swimming against the stream actually i think it's grown uh, we had so many years to evolve and to grow and to widen the support and to find more and more readers who like what we do so it's a story of growing actually i think if you start right now in the year 2024 then it would be much harder Really? Yeah, I think so. But we also have the advantage that most of, at least the German, but also internationally newspapers, they start to paywalling their contents. Yes. And at least uh, on our website, everything is free. It is tracking free too. And I think people appreciate. Mm. Do you find that these bigger newspapers are recognizing the work that you do and that they're even reaching out sometimes for consultations or expert advice? I guess I do definitely. We notice that, of course, and we we have a policy with, in regard of documents and papers, so we put it online in full, and other media people rely on that. And it's a kind of um, well, it's a policy that we have, and also uh, we have some investigative reporting. Mm. So this year we uh, had the data broker story, so we have long-running investigations and other um, yeah, news internationally mostly, uh, they recognize our work, of course. And we also have a podcast and stuff like that, so we are really a media organization in a way, uh, a platform. That's amazing. Um, the world of investigative journalism, I'm curious how you feel about it, especially in the last 20 years, because has it shifted, has it changed? Are we losing some of the ideals that were in place even 10, 20 years ago? I think it's shifting a lot. Um, well, I well, well, I have to say something first. I just don't feel like only a journalist. I'm also an activist, and I would consider myself like that. But speaking of the world of journalism, I see that most investigative stories are corporations right now. We have international investigation teams right now, and all, uh, speaking of tech uh, investigations, all in the last five or six years where teams of international media, like the Pegasus Project, who came up with the state malware business, and all 
There were a lot of examples where not only one or two journalists from one media organization, but uh, no, 10, 12, 15 from international media organizations came together. And I think that's a good thing, but it also shows uh, how hard these investigations are and time consuming. Yeah, I remember, you know, part of your um, keynote today spoke to Edward Snowden and the Snowden files that I remember specifically in the documentaries about that topic, just how many organizations came together and, and like really did the hard work of deciding what was worth making public, what was important to make public and what was really important to keep. I think it was in a way we've never seen that afterwards again, that you have two years or two and a half years cooking that scandal bringing every two weeks new stories, interesting stories with different aspects. And I think Snowden himself did a really good job to explain technical terms. And um, I think the journalist working with him did a really good job explaining what is actually in the papers, what is the political uh, significance of that. And I think we never saw that afterward again, at least not in that scale. Is it because all of these really by chance uh, topics came together. Like the fact that Edward Snowden had so much m mindfulness about what he was doing, how he was doing it, why he was doing it, and also bringing in just, it seemed, the right journalists in Glenn Greenwald and, and the others. Uh, it seems like the perfect, I, I want to say perfect storm, but like the perfect recipe for revealing information that's really important. Is it you know, is that just a unicorn? Is it just by chance that all the stars aligned to make that as important as it was? I think he was mindful about with whom he wanted to work. And uh, Glenn Greenwood did a great job. And also Barton Gelman, of course. And to read his book, I think it's called Dark Side or Dark Mirror. Um, it's really a good reading to learn about how they work together, how the cooperation started and how it progressed, but I also think it was a right moment in time. So if you have such a lot of the, the trove of papers, then you have to have a strategy how to bring it online and uh, to write about it, because if you dump it, well, nobody talks about yeah the, the little things. And if you can stretch it and have journalists who work for you for month and months and also, well, we had German journalists and English and American, but also on other parts of the world, like South America or Asian journalists who worked with him. So that's a big part of the story. And also, I think uh, Laura Poitras' film, Citizen Four, yes. was really a big part. So to get to know the whistleblower and the public wanted to know about the guy. Mm -hmm. And he did a good work shaping his image to a point. Yeah, It doesn't work right now anymore because right. he's stuck in Russia, but... I think he was mindful about his own image, too. Mm. What a balance. <laughs> what a balance of many different factors. Um, can you, you know, that you kicked off your talk, basically, speaking about Edward Snowden's effect on the world. Um, can you give us a sense of your keynote today and maybe just a summary of what you dove into? And we can we can dive into that a little bit more. Well, actually, I talked about mass surveillance, but the starting point is, of course, not Edward Snowden. But since that June 2013 and the years after that, we know a lot more about what is technically really possible and what has really been done. And we also have some court rulings, of course, and we had some parliamentary inquiry commissions. And so we know a lot more um, compared with the status before. But I think for me, it just um, it was just one coincidence in time that we get to know so much about technical mass surveillance. And my hope was 10 years ago that it would really be a change in policy and politics. But it, well, it seems to be that's not the case. Um, on the contrary, we see that techniques of mass surveillance are growing actually and that's what I talked about today and I showed different examples where we can see that not only the technical capabilities are growing but also legal uh, possibilities 
and that we have more kinds of technologies that can be used for mass surveillance, like biometric techniques, facial recognition, that um, they are more technique like automated predictive uh, software, stuff like that. So mm, I would say we are in an age of mass surveillance and um, the problem is most of the public doesn't discuss it anymore and that is really a problem because what Snowden did was not only revealing but a, they are driving a debate and we don't have that debate anymore and that's what really frustrates me and concerns me. Wow. Uh, I wonder if that takes away hope. I mean, you, you mentioned that you know, there's no political discourse anymore, it seems, on these topics, despite them being happening more and more, especially from a technical perspective. So how do you keep hope uh, with that kind of information? Well, I have to admit, actually, in the keynote, there were not so much positive aspect, but I see them. And first is that after the revelations of Snowden, we see some really technical change which changes everyday life of everyday person. And that is, of course, using of encryption. So everybody got an end-to-end -end encrypted messenger today in his pocket, and that's really important. Not just only because of the yeah, intelligent services, but the spying of everybody else. And we also have the, ma the vast majority of internet traffic encrypted right now, and that was not the case 10 years ago. So we tend to think that it's normal right now, but it wasn't normal 10 years ago. And so the tech companies were actually also spying victims of the NSA, changed their policies, and that changed the life of everybody. So let's take the example WhatsApp or something, yeah? Well, it, almost everybody is using it. But what people don't know is that they also have really good encryption in their pocket while using WhatsApp. And that is an everyday life change, which is important. And I think there's a third aspect of it, and that is that much more research is done on surveillance in the academia, is much more talk about it. And the evaluation of my surveillance laws is a topic now, and that is new. Well, now I do feel hopeful, thank you. <laughs> Uh, that said, I mean, it seems like a really difficult problem to solve because as the technology evolves, I mean, artificial intelligence is an example of a technology that's evolved extremely quickly, way faster than any of the policies could keep up. And so how, you know, how do you balance that between the, the people trying to do the good work of putting policies in place that are meaningful for these new technologies, but also just the march forward of, of, of tech? I don't think we have any good balance right now because on the political side, it's not, it, it's really, it's not the zeitgeist to, well, cut back on mass surveillance and on the contrary. But we have some means of balancing it. And that is first, first and foremost, um, the rulings of the highest courts of uh, Europe, that is the European Court of Human Rights. And in Germany, we also have the constitutional courts who had like, more than 10 uh, rulings about technical surveillance, and that is important. But also we have a growing number of uh, NGOs and non-governmental organizations who are active in the field and who try to cut back and to also shape the surveillance policies. Well, in my opinion, Right now, we are not very successful, but there is a community of activists, and I hope that maybe time will change. It will not always be the same in Germany right now. I don't, I don't have very optimistic thoughts because we have a government which, yeah, is applying new mass surveillance laws. But hopefully, times will change here. And activists all over the world can can share their knowledge about the policy changing. So I'm a little bit optimistic. Why well, I love hearing that optimism. I mean, you were involved in uh, some big decisions in the past, the regulations in the EU, um, that gave some optimism 
Can you give us a sense of some of the ones that you were involved in? I mean, there was one way back even in, in 2013. I think uh, what you can expect from the EU level is some, yeah, some more transparency. And that is what's happening in the inquiry about uh, state malware, like the Pegasus uh, spyware. We had an inquiry in the European Parliament, and I was part of the technical expert speaking there. And that is an important part, because you have to have some factual information, and not just what the companies who sell that, that state malware say. And there's a small but very active community involved in and to yeah shed some light into the malware industry. And the second is um, with my work by uh, at Netzpolitik.org, we uh, try to have some reports, of course, articles. We write about stuff that is happening in the EU, that is, um, yeah, well, regulation, but also working groups uh, trying to find new ideas or to find, well, better ideas and mass surveillance. So we write about it too. And also, I guess, um, the work in the Chaos Computer Club is also important because we explain techniques that is mostly the events we organized and speakers we invite there. And also we, we write some reports for parliament or for the constitutional court to explain technology. And that is part of my work. And maybe if, if, you, if, if you are getting active in some of the fields you're an expert in, then, well, you also have motivation and hope at the same time. So it, and sometimes I'm angry and frustrated, of course, but it helps me cope with it. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned the Chaos Computer Club there. Um, can you explain a little bit what the Chaos Computer Club is, what it does, who it is, who it's for? I guess in uh, Germany, almost everybody knows Chaos Computer Club because we are, well, we are in the news sometimes. And it's a hacker collective, actually, but a large one. We are a hacker community, but in a wider sense of a word, of course. Yeah, We are not criminal hackers stealing bitcoins from someone, but we have that hacking thinking to, well, to take a look at computer systems in different ways, I, I would translate it to, and we also have a hacker E6. But um, the community is um, mostly shaped from events, from hackerspaces, from, um, yeah, from within the community, from sharing knowledge, and that is, yeah, the core of the Chaos Computer Club. And also, we could shape the image of the hacker, at least in the German sphere, a little bit different. So mostly people in Germany know that hackers are not always criminals, but there's an ambivalent. Yeah, <laughs> of course. So, yeah, we manage that. And so I'm quite proud to be part of that community. And I work for um, a yeah, spokeswoman for the Chaos Computer Club, I think, 16 years now. It's a long time. Wow, yeah. it is impressive. Uh, it's not really work. We just, it's voluntary stuff in our spare time. Wow. Okay. So it sounds like if you'd like to, I don't know, get involved in doing some of this work, that's a great place to start. It is because we have hacker spaces. You can go to there. These are physical spaces. It's also, of course, hybrid and online spaces. But uh, to have physical spaces to meet is quite important, not only for knowledge sharing, but to have at least a kind of a second home where you meet people who are like-minded, who are also nerdy, and you meet sane people. <laughs> that's, that's really a big part of the hacker community here. It sounds like if you can find a hacker community near you, then go for it, right? Yeah. That's, oh, that's a great place. Oh, you At the Chaos Computer Club, it's quite easy to build your own little space and then just dock on. And that's what actually happened. When I started in the Chaos Computer Club, I think we were a thousand uh, members or something, and now we are over nine thousand. So it's a really growing, well, but maybe not like an explosion growing, but a slowly growing every year community. And I think it's part of the hacker identity here. So we have a lot of ethical hackers here in Germany. We 
and they can well they can relate to our ideas and that is that's yeah quite important i guess it it seems like you know i spent a lot of time in berlin which has quite a hacker community right there's cbase of course it, i am a member of cbase now i will be proud to say <laughs> i've spent so much time there they're wonderful people so if you're ever in berlin cbase is another place to go um but you know are you I think Germany has had that sort of hackerish mentality for quite some decades now. You wouldn't know. Take a guess. How old is the Chaos Computer Club? Take a guess. What would you say? Well, okay. Uh, since you prefaced that with probably it's going to be more than I think, uh, uh -huh. I want to suppose it might have started with radio. Is that true? Mm, not that bad. Okay, so okay. we are 43 this Thursday. Wow. Uh, the 12th of September. Okay. Yeah. That is super it's, impressive. Yeah. And so we have, at least we have a generational project here. The founders of the CCC are really, well, they're s senior members right now. <laughs> so it's I'm, I'm actually the third generation of hackers. And they are much younger people than I am, the uh, fourth and fifth generations. So if you come to the Congress, which is our largest um, gathering with like 12,000 people or something like that, then you see it's really like a community meeting with all kind of ages. And that's really interesting to see that's grown into a really generational project. Okay, so how are you seeing the no, those new generations? What ideas are they latching on to to start to become involved in some of the con these concepts? Right. The obvious difference is, of course, that they've grown into that technology and that uh, the older members of the CCC, they know just in analog times. That is a difference, but I think uh, um, having the sense of being a hacker and taking a look at computer sy systems a different way, it's just what uh, the younger hackers do too. I think that's not very different. That's what I would say. The computers have just gotten smaller and they fit in your pocket now, right? Yeah, and of course, I mean, the field is spreading. Uh, Formerly, mostly hacker were into software and some and hardware, and how and today it's very different fields. You, know, you can have forensic experts and stuff like that, and also, of course, developers and, and software engineers. But it's really a large field. If you compare it with uh, computer science or some, something like that, you have um, not just only that one computer science that university is, but you have a lot of different aspects to it. And that is the same for the hacker community, I guess. Mm, and maybe it's, uh, well, the image of the hacker, which is ambivalent, doesn't hurt because people are mostly, oh, want to know more about hackers. So uh, something they don't like. I go to schools sometimes and present the hacker ethics and hacker ideas. And sometimes they look at me, oh, they have women too. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. no. I, I like it. It's okay. okay. Well, I mean, I would imagine that you're inspiring many people to, you know, follow in your footsteps in a way, likely in their own. In their own. I hope so sometimes. But the fact of the matter is when, when I studied computer science, we were just 10 percent women. And it's uh, just the same nowadays. So the numbers doesn't really change. But in the hacker community, they, they did change. So we have now, I don't know, 20 percent uh, women, which is more than in the computer science community. But it's very slow progress. And I don't know why, actually. I mean, I like technology. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know who, who wouldn't. Uh, I mean, technology doesn't care who you are as long as you're enjoying it, right? <laughs> in a way. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so, I mean, we've we've shared many different concepts here, but it seems like Privacy is a big portion of it, and also taking those ideas into your own hands and becoming a, a hacktivist, if you will. Um, in in terms of the activist side of things, um, how's that going? Like, are people joining in the same ways as they're joining the the hacker communities? Are they finding some interests? Well, first of all, we live in a different digital world, of course. Yeah, you know, they are not just only a few experts dealing with technology, but a lot of people whose work or profession is technology in different kinds of ways. So 
and that is mirrored in the hacker community too, in in a way. And also, we live in very different times. Speaking of vulnerabilities and exploits, and selling of vulnerability and exploits, and the disclosure processes they changed a lot. But I think um, the hacker ethic still holds in a way. So that's forming some kind of identity for the hacker community. So for the younger and the older. Uh, can you give us a, a summary of hacker ethics then? Well, actually, the hacker ethics is quite old. And uh, Stephen Levy, who wrote it down, and was just in Berlin talking about it. Yeah, it was a very interesting talk. Uh, he, yeah, he talked a little bit about the evolution and the start of the hacker ethics. Actually, uh, the German hacker ethics is a little bit different from the older one, which is, well, more than five decades old, um, because we added some stuff. Um, and mostly, yeah, the core is mistrust um, authorities and share information but protect private information. And you can do art with computers. It's, well, it's not a normative ethic, but ideas to share. And um, we also had a big discussion in Germany about um, money and hacks, but it's actually not part of the hacker E6 right now. Mm, and we also have ongoing discussions if we want to maybe change something on the hacker E6, but it's an ongoing debate. And I think it's just... Uh, the version that Stephen Levy wrote so many decades ago holds in a way because it's about sharing knowledge and that is thing, an identity thing for hackers. Yeah. Well, I can certainly associate with some of those ideas. So thank you for sharing. Um, have you seen your own relationship with technology evolving in the last? 20 years since you've been involved in all of this? And, yeah, of course. And so what, what comes to mind first these days is like kind of the most important thing you have in mind? I think as everybody who lives in the well, first world countries, yeah, the change, the real change was a smartphone, of course. Yeah, we, we almost don't have a choice but to change, right? Uh, right, but uh, if you look at the market of operating system for smartphones, then you can scratch your head because there's just only two. And uh, where the power which the operating systems manufacturer hold uh, are very strong. So, um, of course, my personal life changed a lot, as for everybody else, and technology is a part of everybody's life right now. But we also I think um, that the powers which the tech companies hold change our lives and I think it's a good thing that there is a debate about um, platform capitalism and entitification and stuff like that that the term Cory Doctorow of course yeah of yeah. course but I think it's more in a technical community a debate right now and not so much a political debate so um, maybe it's um Maybe one of the reasons is the European GDPR, which is the central um, uh, legislation for personal data. And we got this, and it's an example for the international community. But my feeling is since the GDPR is uh, in, yeah, it's in practice now for five years, everybody check boxes. So. We don't need any discussion anymore. We have the GDPR in, in Europe, and that is not it's enough. It's final. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, well, it's not evolved from there. And frankly speaking, we wouldn't have the GDPR without Snowden. Yeah, that was a moment in time that wow. we, yeah. I hadn't really made that connection, but you're absolutely right. We won't have a second GDPR because times have changed, and not for the better. We live in a fully tracked, yeah, uh, world and not so many people are talking about it anymore and i wish to change that but i thought in a western-based country uh, we weren't being tracked and this was only you know abroad in other uh, other distant places that they were using tracking all over well they have of course the the u.s tech content and also the chinese uh, tech content they have some regulation here in europe but to be honest that is not 
really changing anything in, in tracking. And right. remember, we, we also wanted to have an e-privacy regulation that it never, it never came into an actual law. So times have changed. And uh, if, if we wouldn't have the um, court rulings, then I think at uh, times would be even worse. And what it lacks a public debate about what kind of digital world we want to live in. And we had that, and it was after the uh, Snowden revelation for a long time, part of the public debate, and we don't have that anymore. I think people give in to a certain degree, or they feel they can't do anything about it anymore. It just becomes normalized. This is our new normal, and you don't question it, but maybe you shouldn't, right? I don't want to be that negative because I think we can change it, and it will change, but uh, that's just for the time being. It feels to me almost like we need another Snowden, but feels like what you've been suggesting now that it's really difficult for something like that to happen. So uh, what would it take? I don't think there will be a second Snowden because of his unique personality and the way he handled the papers and document and the way he worked with the journalist. And also because I think the intelligence services learned their lessons. There will be no technical way within the intelligence services to tr to have so many documents uh, and take them with you. I think if they are not really dumb, they will prevent a second Snowden in speaking of the many documents. And also, and it's getting harder and harder to really have scandals. I mean, media-wise scandals that you have. Uh, such an enormous um, public outcry and globally that is really hard uh, right now and also we don't have any social media debating platform anymore since Twitter is a far right you know that so it's it's much more difficult for well nowadays whistleblowers at least let's hope that there will be some well I think there's a lesson to be learned there uh, for those big governments about what to do with whistleblowers and how to prevent them, right? We've seen many whistleblowers try even after Snowden and uh, the consequences were very different. And also we don't have good le legislation, at least not in Europe and also not in Germany to protect them. If it's, yeah, yeah, that's a problem. And also they see, of course, the fate of Snowden. And I don't think that many people want to get stuck in Russia. I mean, that's maybe not the ideal to strive for. Well, and it seems like maybe that was a failure of European countries in a way, right? Surely was. For Germany and any other European country, I think they should have protected Snowden. And they should have given him asylum. And I think it's not too late. They could to do it right now. So... My hope was that the um, government right now in Germany would maybe show a way for asylum to Snowden, but as it seems now, they will not. And I don't know if anything new will happen after the election in the U.S., um, and I don't think Kamala Harris will be the U.S. president uh, who... Uh, I don't think... You know, yeah, I don't think she will do anything for Snowden, no. Do you have any, I don't know, insights, theories, feelings about why those countries didn't help? Like, because it seems to me like there's a dichotomy here. It's like, well, we care about privacy. We care about, uh, you know, the best interest of the citizens. And yet at the same time, we're not willing to help one person who helped reveal to the world some of the most important topics on the, you know. Well, frankly speaking, I think that the um, the... German government at, at that time, that 2013, but also the uh, German government right now is not willing to have any fight with the U.S. government. And that means the cooperation between the intelligence services is much more important than a single person sitting in, in Moscow. So I think there wasn't any political will to really help him. The, the lawyers of Snowden were in German parliament and they pressed the German government and they uh, pressed um, Angela Merkel. 
and um, the ministers, but it actually never was any real initiative to, yeah, to help him. And I think it's, yeah, that's very sad because, well, if they travel to China or, I don't know, um, to Saudi Arabia, they keep talking about human rights and stuff like that. But if they have the power in their hand to really help somebody who is a prototype for a whistleblower, well, then I think they didn't dare to face the consequences of the U.S. government, and that is sad. And I think it, we had a little hope, at least here in Germany, that with the new government, which is left-leaning, actually that what we thought, <laughs> that would be maybe a way, but they, they didn't have any initiative for that. I uh, pause there for a moment because it feels like, I don't know, deflating? Is that the word? <laughs> we have to face the fact the, the intelligence services in the U.S., but also in Germany and in most of the larger European countries, are a powerhouse. They used to shape policies. And, well, the Five Eyes Alliance is important, but Germany and also um, Sweden and some other European countries are dependent on, yeah, the data policies of the intelligence services from the U.S. and the Five Eyes, and they wouldn't dare to question decisions of the U.S. government. That's sad to notice, and it's well, it's also for me, it's also a legal question, because the lawyers of Snowden had good arguments. It's a sad story. The Chaos Computer Club. Um, by um, large voting of its members paid the lawyers' fees for some years and we really hope that the international team of lawyers could find any democratic government who would support Snowden and help him to get asylum, but, well, it doesn't actually happen. And here we are. Does that, as an activist yourself, feel like it puts limitations on what you're capable of accomplishing? Oh, not really. Well, we are realistically enough that we know that that high-profile case of Snowden is maybe not the, the poster child ca case. And so we have other cases. And, and there are also um, uh, other NGOs here in Germany and in, in, in Europe who try to strategic litigation, they try the legalistic way, so we have many activists in that field so I think there's hope and optimism yeah, of course there's also frustration, of course but that's driving us too I guess. It's a motivator <laughs> Yeah, it is, in a way, yeah if I'm not angry anymore at specific <laughs> politics or laws which I find are unfair or illegal, then where I got the energy from, I don't know <laughs> you mentioned successes there. Can you share some recent successes that you and maybe the Chaos Computer Club or Nets Politik has, have had that you know keep you going every day? We have, of course, some successes in court, and we helped shaping those ruling when we write technical expertise, written technical expertise, and we also oral hearings at the Constitutional Court where we participated. We have some rulings in the last, yeah. 10, 15 years, which supported our view, criticizing mass surveillance. Um, we also have a constitutional court uh, ruling about voting computers. And since then, we don't have any voting computers in Germany anymore, which is, I think, a good thing. C can you explain why? <laughs> yeah, we had them here 15 years ago. Um, but actually, they were very intransparent. We couldn't even have a look at the software. And so we had to get some of the voting computers and hack them and show how easily <laughs> they they can be I manipulated. Okay. Yeah. And it ended some several months later with the ruling of our constitutional court that these voting computers are unconstitutional and the law underlying uh, was too. And so wow. we didn't have any attempt from any German politician to have new laws allowing voting computers. 
Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. But sometimes it came to my mind that maybe it was not such a good idea when you remember the latest uh, voting results here in Germany. But it would be against the Hanker Ethics, of course. Uh, one topic you did mention in your keynote earlier today was uh, predictive policing. And I think for those of us who've seen, I don't know, Minority Report or read that book uh, or even read 1984, those kind of uh, historical books, like it's obviously an important topic. So can, tell me your thoughts and where that's going. Mostly those vendors, they promise that they have good prediction software. Mostly, in fact, it's mostly software which integrates uh, different kinds of databases which analyzes on a very basic level those data and which make it accessible in a way for intelligence services or police services. In Germany, it's mostly police, but also intelligence services. Um, I think the largest tech uh, company in the world is Palantir, uh, Palantir um, which is uh, not very known, but actually a billion... Uh, a billion company is really large in terms of, well, money. Um, and also they have uh, contracts in a lot of uh, European countries, not only for police and intelligence services, but also for like health data and stuff like that. And they are also a large military contractor. So they are uh, large vendors who try to sell these software products to police and uh, they promising, well, magic actually, and that they find the needle in the haystack and that they connect the dot and they find the extremists and, and, and terrorists, of course. But we have also, um, yeah, some criticism. We even have in February this year the first constitutional court ruling about. Uh, police use of the, those predictive software and it was illegal actually the two laws we had on um, in, in Germany so there's some hope that there will be some legal challenges for those companies here in Europe because this is also very intransparent they present black boxes to the police and they well, they dump all the data in and they get something out. And I think that's not the way it should work with people's data. And once and most people very much more, one time in your life you get contacted to the police. Well, you are maybe a victim or you can share some thought with the police or you are in any way in any police database. So they dump the data in that. In transparent the software black boxes, it could not be the way. And well... Also, they pay a lot of money for that. How convenient. Uh, I, I would imagine that it's really tempting as a police force who, even if you have the best interests in mind of like protecting people, if they're it's making also these also tempting promises. just for practical reasons. Sure. They have a zoo from police databases, really a zoo, like 25 different police databases from the 70s to the 90s. And there comes a company and says, oh, okay. We help you structure the data. Yeah, that's really mostly practical. And then they promise you, we also find the terrorists for you. Well, it's tempting. How could you say no? We, we had, of course, the police in uh, Germany who uses those software products in court when we had the oral hearing. But actually, they just have one or two cases that they can present, but they don't have any evaluation data. Well, that's obviously a problem, right? You mentioned the black box and, well, changing people's lives with black box is obviously quite problematic. And it is feels disappointing that some of the realities that have been imagined in books from the 50s and 40s are really coming to fruition. And so it's important for people like you and Netspolitik and all these organizations to keep pushing back. So in that way, thank you very much for the work you're doing with everyone that you work with as well. It's uh, for, from all of us, super, super important work. We hope to continue. We are not on the end of the fight. We keep fighting. Uh, if anyone is interested in, in joining you in, in some of these, you know, hacktivist activities, um, where's a good place for a start for someone who's never done it before? 
first of all, we have really good events, smaller and one really large event in end of December, which is really the perfect starting point if you want to meet a hacker and you want to get part of the community, just go to the places. I think that's most important. Most of the hacker spaces in Germany, they also have, I don't know, matrix channels or chat rooms or something like that. So you can maybe have a little chat before you join the events. But I would go to a physical event. That is, I think, the best yeah, idea if you want to really yeah, get to know something. And also we have a website, cccde, uh, ccc.de. So you can go. The dot is important. Yeah. <laughs> but mostly um, the CCC is not a centralized thing. It's really about the hackerspaces. And we have 60 of them or something. Really a lot for a small country. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why an in-person event? Because it's so easy to get connected online. Yeah, we have not just the large event. We have a lot of really small events. We are just 100 people guards. Or, or we have a, the geek ends or something like that. And... I think if you really want to meet those people and get to know their mindset and see some project which they are working on, that's a perfect start. Do you have anything you're working on currently or anything you're quite passionate about that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, in fact, um, I work a lot on state malware, uh, state trojans, and um, yeah, I'm part of the active community who really fight back against a commercial spyware market but it seems to me that will be a long fight but hey I'm used to long fights <laughs> just getting started right <laughs> well I hope that fight isn't too long but also you know it's an important one so doing it right is uh... we plan to win the fight <laughs> oh good and you won't stop until it's won right <laughs> Well, Constance, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I just want to say on behalf of all of us, thank you for doing the work that you're doing. My pleasure.